And now, it's time for Mob Talk Radio with your host, Jeff Canarsie. I'm clearing that up. Uh, But this is going to be actually a three-part series because there's just a lot of stuff to sift through, and it's uh, pretty crazy. So we left off on December 10th. Oh, and by the way, before I I say this, next week, all right, the show will not be out on Friday. It will be out on Saturday. So next week, if, if I email you the show or whatever the case may be, if you're like, oh, where's my fucking show? Free it a week. (laughs) <laughs> you know all of you guys are going to run around and start calling people free of the week now i know you are and email me if you did because it's funny oh free of the week get over here i'm going to start using it it's probably going to get me in trouble uh <laughs> do you know what my friend down in south philly i know you're listening because i because i give you the show i want to say that to the gorilla the next time i say oh free of the week let's shake it <laughs> i'm gonna do it Oh, I'm such a prick. Anyway, so the show will not be out next Friday. It will be out next Saturday because uh, I'm going to be out of town. So we'll be back on next Saturday after this week. So anyway, last uh, <coughs> last week, we left off on December 10th of 1969 uh, as Cavatayo and 10 of his men were killed in the Viali Lazio region, or excuse me, in the Viali Lazio, which was a street north of Palermo. The murder was carried out by our usual suspects, Bernardo Provenzano, Clodro Bagarella, and Emmanuel D'Agostino, uh, Gaetano Grotto, Damian Caruso. Uh, the murder was also known as Viali Lazio Massacre. Uh, it's worth noting that these men came from the GG, <coughs> excuse me, the De Cristina, the De Cristina crime family <coughs> and the Santa Maria di Gizu family. Um, and basically, the killers walked into the office, and we went through all of that. So this week, uh, it's the rise of Totorina. Uh, Bernardo, a little bit of Bernardo Provenzano, not a lot on him, but all hell's going to break loose uh, in ways that a lot of you probably just cannot imagine. Uh, whatever bloodshed had begun, Italy had seen absolutely nothing yet, and Reno would prove that he was the guy that you avoid and the guy that you should not piss off for any fucking reason. So, as we know, Luciano Leggio had been hiding and giving his directives to Rina and Provenzano and others. Just want to drop back for one second because, as you know, in the 1960s, Luciano Leggio, Toto Rina, and Bernardo Provenzano spent years basically killing any supporters of Navarra uh, and would end up going into hiding uh, because they had arrest warrants. Uh, we know that Leggio and Rina were arrested and tried in ni- Am I reading the right fucking one? Hold on a sec. Yeah, I am. Okay, we know that Leggio and Reno were arrested and tried in 1969 for murders carried out earlier in that decade. They were acquitted, uh, as we said, because of witness intimidation and juror intimidation as well. They would walk in a Rena a year later would be indicted for more murders, and then he would take off and would officially become uh, a fugitive for the next 23 fucking years. In 1974, Luciano Leggio would be captured and put into prison for the 1958 murder of uh, Michael Navarra. Uh, Even if Leggio uh, had pulled from behind the wall in prison, uh, he had to change leadership within the Corleonese Mafia. Uh, He basically slides aside and Toto Reno would take over as the official boss of the Corleonese Mafia. What made Toto Reno different in one aspect was his close bond with Andrangheta, specifically Domenico Tripodo. 
uh, who was uh, an Andrangheta boss and was the best man at Toto Arena's wedding in 1974. With Legio effectively pretty much out of the leadership role, it meant that Toto Arena could consolidate his power. And one of the things that was in the back of his mind was narcotics trafficking. Uh, for decades, his enemies had controlled the narcotics trade in Palermo, and he wasn't about to allow them to continue to keep making the profits without his okay and without sharing in the profits or without his opinion being known. Uh, one of his main enemy, his main enemies consisted of Stefano Bontide, Salvatore Anzarello, and Tano Badalamente. We also know as uh, Gaetano Badalamente, and each man was a boss of their own respective families in Sicily, specifically based in Palermo. Uh, historically, uh, the most powerful were those from Palermo. However, Legio had really consolidated power for so many years and had gained a foothold with other Sicilian families. And as Rena stepped into bat, so to speak, uh, he not only brought some Sicilian families with him, but he also brought Andrangheta as well. Uh, the Corleonese Mafia had really began to make waves, sort of as we say, and became feared in many different ways. We know that after the Mafia trials in the 1960s, um, it ended with little convictions and it, it it sort of, you know, everybody they indicted sort of kind of walked. And so then it became business as usual in Sicily. We also know uh, that Sicilian, that the Sicilian commission, which had once been dissolved, uh, but after those trials, they reformed the commission again in 1970 and Stefano Bontide and uh, Gaetano Badalamente uh, made up two thirds of the actual commission itself. There were actually ten members on the commission, but there were only three heads, and the three were uh, Stefano Bontide, uh, Gaetano Badalamente, and the third would have been Luciano Legio. But with Legio in hiding at the time, Toto Rina was sitting in his place. Uh, friction is, you know, one of those things, ladies and gentlemen. And and Rina saw things that he didn't like, but because at the time he was not the official boss, there was little he could do. He didn't control the commission. Uh, and, and in so many ways, he was at the behest of everybody else because two thirds vote, two guys say yes, and you say no, well, you're fucked. Um, and I think he knew that. And, and he also knew that he would probably be outvoted on just about everything. But that would change in 1974 when Legio gets put behind the wall. And one of the things that Rena does realize early on was that he needed to consolidate power. The two thirds vote against him left him little choice but to try and level out the playing field. Uh, we talk all the time on this show about street politics, and this is going to be a great example of how, excuse me, street politics works. Um, Toto Arena knew if he was left to his own devices, anything he wanted to accomplish on the commission was pretty much null and void because Bontide and Badalamente were both Palermo bosses. Meanwhile, Rena represented the Corleonese Mafia. So it's two against one. Okay, so but keep in mind, Sicily is a goddamn island. All of this shit that we're about to talk about from this week to next week takes place on a fucking island, all right? It's just very important that you realize that because it it really just, it blows my mind. It just blows my mind that all of these people are fighting on a fucking island. Uh, it, it's like putting Vito Genovese, Carlo Gambino, Lucky Luciano, and like six other bosses in Cuba, and they're all going to fight each other. I mean, that's, it's just, it's crazy, all right? So... Uh, Reno knows he's not going to get anywhere if it's left up to votes. So what he does is what real bosses do. They start the politic. Uh, one of the things that Toto Reno does is he begins to reach other, out to other mafia families. He begins to make headway in doing so. One of the things he wants is control of the commission or to at least even things out enough so that he can do what he wants to do. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I really don't think he gave a fuck about the commission or even leading it. I don't think he cared about anything. I just think he wanted to be the whole entire boss of Sicily, and that was the bottom line. Nothing more, nothing less. But he had to give the appearance at least that he was trying to be diligent and be fair. Uh, and what he does end up doing is getting Palermo boss of uh, Porta Nuova, Giuseppe Cowell, on his side of the fence. That was followed by Filippo Marchese, who at the time was the boss of Partana Mandello. He comes over to, to Toto Reina's side of the fence. Uh, and what he's doing is giving himself outlets. He's giving himself power. He's consolidating. He's trying to break the monopoly of the commission. Uh, the first order of business was to address the Prince Junio Valerio Borghese issue. Uh, Prince Junio Valerio Borghese 
uh, who was a prince, wanted support for a neo-fascist coup, and in return, he would pardon mobsters such as Vincent Remy and Luciano Leggio. And it was decided that Giuseppe Calderone and Giuseppe Di Cristina would head to Rome and sit down with Borghese. Uh, the commission talked about it, and Badalamenti was totally against the plan, and for good reason. He feared Luciano Leggio. But the plan didn't work out anyway. But the point was is that Badalamenti uh, belly ached about it in front of Rena. And Rena just, you know, his eyebrows kind of go up. And, All right, motherfucker, if that's the way you want to do things. And so Rena sort of looks at Badalamenti as this guy's going to be a problem. And you need to get the fuck out of my way. The other issue was that Badalamenti was essentially now the head of the commission. Uh, and because Badalamenti had business interests with Bontide and a monopoly on heroin and drugs that also created a sort of problem. Um, and, and I think Rena realized that both of them were going to be a thorn in his side. So in 1975, uh, Gaetano Badalamenti gets involved in the pizza connection. We've talked about that before. He also aligns himself with Salvatore Catalano, who was known as Sal, the iron worker, uh, who was actually back here in New York and was a member of the Sicilian faction of the Bonanno crime family. In January of 1978, Salvatore Greco, who was a sitting member of the commission, he had previously fled to Venezuela to avoid prosecution during the mafia trial, came back, and he has a sit-down with Gaetano Badalamenti, and he had hopes of trying to restrain him. And the problem was is that Badalamenti had cornered the market on narcotics and Badalamenti was sort of starting to get a big head and he was beginning to make idle threats. To add to the issues, uh, Giuseppe Di Cristina and Giuseppe Calderone were also making idle threats to decapitate the Coralian AC who were growing more and more powerful. And with Badalamenti on their side, Greco was sort of hoping to just calm the fucking waters because things were starting to uh, just get very toxic and get very, very uh, negative very quickly. Uh, because I think Greco, Salvatore Greco, kind of saw the way this was going to go. He knew there would be a war if he didn't do anything, but he tries to step in uh, and, and tries to do the right thing. Um, but something else comes up, and one of the things that comes up is uh, Badalamenti and uh, Giuseppe Di Cristina, who separately controlled their own mafia families, wanted to murder Francesco Madonia. Uh, Madonia was the boss of the, uh, excuse me, the Vallelunga uh, mafia family, and he was a staunch friend and a staunch ally of the Corleonesi. Uh, and he was also involved in narcotics trafficking. So what Badalamenti and Di Cristina want to do is take the head off Francesco Madonia because that re that takes somebody away from Toto Arena that he needs or who they suspect he fucking needs. Uh, Greco, try, Salvatore Greco tried to talk sense to them. He says, avoid the murder. Don't do this. Uh, he even offered Di Cristina, why don't you leave Sicily? You come with me back to Venezuela. I'll set you up to run narcotics there. You won't have these problems. He was trying to do everything he could to get these men to just stop their nonsense. And basically, uh, everything that he pled to them was met on deaf ears. On April 8th of 1978, Madonia gets clipped on an order from Gaetano Badalamenti and uh, Giuseppe Di Cristina. When Rena finds out he's irate and he retaliates, um, he doesn't wait long. He waits 30 days and he has Di Cristina whacked immediately. In September, Giuseppe Calderone gets killed. There would be a meeting and it was decided that Badalamenti was creating havoc. So the commission meets and they realize Badalamenti is going to start a fucking war. Rena's in his right to retaliate. Um, this is just a big problem and him greenlighting the, mur the murder of Madonia, who had done nothing wrong other than just being an ally of the, Cor of the Corleonesi, uh, it just, it was a bad look. It was a bad look. And so what the commission does is they remove Badalamenti immediately and they threw him off the commission before things could get any worse. Michael Greco would end up replacing Badalamenti on the commission, which was something that Reno was okay with. He was able to remove probably the most dangerous man from the commission, and that essentially leveled the playing field. And then the commission does something else. They basically throw Badalamenti out of the fucking mafia because of what he pulled. They didn't like it. They had standards. They had beliefs. They had tradition. And he broke every rule, and it was fucking up everybody's business. And so basically, they remove Badalamenti as boss, and they chase him to another country, but they allow him 
to replace the leadership to his cousin, a guy by the name of Antonio Badalamente. Uh, Badalamente, like I said, ends up leaving Italy and he sends, settles in, in Brazil. Uh, and even with Badalamente out of Italy, it didn't stop him from narco trafficking in the United States. He kept it going. Uh, so Rena partially gets what he wants, but he also wants to rid the monopoly that his enemies have on narcotics. Uh, even with Badalamente out of the way, Rena still had serious problems with Bontiden and Zarillo. Uh, it's one thing for Badalamente to control the market, uh, but Bontide and Inzarello courted the market too. So you just all you did was just cut one guy out of the process. Now you got a bigger problem, uh, and Reno wasn't going to have any of it. Uh, Bontide, Inzarello, and Spatola, and the Gambinos, yes, the New York crime family, those Gambinos, had established a network involving heroin trafficking. Uh, the Gambino in charge of that from the New York perspective was John Gambino, who we've talked about before on this show. Uh, granted, the pizza connection decimated the sheer volume of the heroin going back and forth, but Bontide, Spataro, and Inzarello would supply John Gambino, uh, and more specifically the Gambino crime family, with um, lab-made heroin, which contained Turkish morphine, a Turkish morphine base, which was very hard to get. It made it very pure. Uh, the racket was pulling in close to $600 million a year. The proceeds from those drugs went back to Italy where they took the money and they invested it into real estate. They would push further into construction and then Bontide would become a construction fucking magnet uh, and one of the biggest taxpayers in Sicily. Uh, they then would take the proceeds from that and they would launder it through banks using a guy by the name of Michael Sindona. And there's a whole thing there, but we're not going to touch that. Uh, Bontide would then start to make some moves politically to control fucking everyone. So not only is he cornered the market on drugs, now he's got the biggest real estate company, the biggest construction company. Now he's starting to put money in the pockets of politicians. Uh, and Rena says, okay, enough of this shit. Enough. I've seen enough. Uh, Rena's position was simple. Uh, nobody should be cornering the market on fucking anything. Uh, and while I and, and obviously all of you can understand, you know, that from a monetary perspective, what Rena truly wanted at the end of the day was total control of Italy. <coughs> he wanted to push other groups out and make them subservient to him. Uh, Rena behind the scenes, as, as we said earlier, had begun to make big allies in Sicily and many who would have naturally sided with the Palermo based families actually end up switching to the Corleonese mafia, which by many accounts broke every fucking single rule about loyalty in Cosa Nostra. Uh, arena slowly pulled many strong families to his side. It's not like he took the weakest family and got them to do what he wanted. He grabbed some big fucking people. And that move was designed to weaken Palermo bosses, and it, it was directly meant to weaken the Bontide, Spataro, and Zarello faction. In 1980, Totorino would get a bit of a gift when in March of 1980, uh, the top-tier members of the Inzarillo crime family, the Spatola crime family, and the Gambino crime family in Sicily all get arrested for heroin trafficking, and it weakened Bontide significantly. Uh, and as we know, with blood in the water, the Great White will attack. And that's exactly what our little pal, Toto Rina, is going to do. On April 23rd of 1981, Bontide is driving home from a lavish 42nd birthday party in Palermo when Pino Greco stepped out from behind a wall and opened up with an AK-47. And he kills Bontide on the spot. Pino Greco was the cousin of Michael Greco. So obviously, Rina and the Grecos had formed a solid alliance. The Second Mafia War had officially begun. Rina knew in order to kill the snake... You had to cut off his fucking head. Two weeks later, Salvatore Inzarello gets murdered coming out of his mistress's house. Once again, our little pal Pino Greco uses the AK-47. And Inzarello was shot so many times he was nearly cut in half and unrecognizable. And there were two reasons for the murder of Inzarello. The first was, prior to this event, he had had the judge who was prosecuting his family for the narcotics beef, he had the judge killed. And he did so without the permission of the commission. Um, and the fact that he committed that murder in the territory of another boss by the name of Giuseppe Callo. So it, in their traditions, you don't whack somebody else on somebody else's turf because it makes them look like they did something wrong. It's a disrespect thing. So not only did he kill a judge, but he did it on another boss's turf. Okay. The second reason 
was he was powerful. And Toto Rina and the Grecos wanted to handicap the partnership between the Spataro and Zarello and the Gambino crime family. They wanted to just crush that. The commission wouldn't react to the murder of Inzarello because, well, he moved against a judge. He disrespected uh, Giuseppe Cowo, so fuck him. That's sort of kind of the way the commission looked at it. That's why they didn't get involved. And as we know it, the second mafia war was officially on. And it was on on an epic fucking scale. Uh, and Toto Rina <laughs> was just, just getting his hands warm. At the funeral of Salvatore Inzarello, his son, Giuseppe, vowed to avenge the death of his father. Word would get back to Toto Rina, and without hesitation, our little old friend Pino again. Pino Greco gets called in to handle business. Giuseppe Inzarello would be kidnapped, and he would be tortured for days. Greco is said to have asked Inzarello which hand he would use to kill Reno with. This is after he's like tortured him, ice picked his balls and tied him up and everything. And the boy raises his right arm to symbolize I would use my right arm, my right hand to kill this prick. Greco grabs a fucking machete and cuts his goddamn arm off while he's alive. Then he uses rock salt to close the blood flow and then continue to torture him for two more fucking days. Greco eventually would shoot Inzarello in the fucking head. A week later, May 26th of 1981, Santo Inzarello, the brother of Salvatore Inzarello, who was also involved in organized crime, went to an organized crime meeting, and he began to ask clarification about what happened to his brother. Why did it happen? Wrong move. He would be strangled to death at that meeting for even asking. <laughs> Tell Tarina to fuck around. And, and just some interesting lineage here, because I'm sure some of you mob aficionados are hearing some famous names. So the Inzarellos were related by blood to the Meninos and the Spatolas, the Castellanos, the Gambinos, and the Dimaggios. So the Inzarellos were related to Paul Castellano. They were related to the Dimaggio crime family, the Spatolas, and Carlo Gambino. That would have made the Inzarellas related to Paul Castellano, like I said, and Carlo Gambino. Former Gambino crime family boss Frank Cowie married into the Inzarello crime family. So, there's your connection. So, in the winter of 1981, Antonio Inzarello, who was a boss for a short period within the Inzarello crime family, was found dead, shot with a sawed-off shotgun in New Jersey. Not long after that, Pietro Inzarello, who was the brother of Salva Salvatore Inzarello, was found in January in the trunk of a car. And he was found in front of a Hilton Hotel in Mount Oral, New Jersey. He had $5 bills shoved in his mouth and two single dollars on his prick. Both men were killed on the orders of Toto Rina. Rina used two hitmen. Turns out, one of the two men who took part was a guy by the name of Tommaso Inzarello. He was a cousin of Salvatore Inzarello. To save his own ass, he agreed to murder his cousin. And he pulled the trigger. And he wasn't the only one. Another cousin of the Inzarellos, Antonio Rotolo, excuse me, Antonino Rotolo, was with Tommaso Inzarello and helped kill the Inzarellos. That was the kind of power that Rena had. He turned family against family. From across the fucking ocean. He was ordering the murders of Gambino made men and anyone with the Inzarillo name. Rena didn't give a fuck. They were all going to die. So as word traveled back, and like I said last week, I meant to say Paul Castellano, not Carlo Gambino, so forgive me for that, but Paul Castellano was very aware of the issues in Sicily. Uh, he was also aware that bodies were showing up in the United States that were in Zarillo's and they were showing up everywhere. Uh, in an effort to stop the bloodshed, Castellano sent John Gambino to Italy to sit down with Rena and to ask Rena to stop. What would it take for him to stop? Rena probably, believe it or not, could have killed John Gambino just for even asking him. And Rena probably could have reached out and killed Paul Castellano. That's how serious this guy was. He could have done it easily. But basically, Rena tells John Gambino, he says, listen, as long as the Inzarellos leave Italy and stay in the United States, I will never bother them. But if they dare come back to Italy, I will kill every single one of them. Mother, women, children, dogs, giraffes, squirrels, hippos, 
Anything within Zarell is going to be killed. And so John Gambino returns and he lets Paul with you know knows lets Paul know what the deal is. And Castellano says, All right, well, it is what it is. Uh, and then Castellano would help send money to the Inzarellos to get them the fuck out of Italy. Now, the Inzarellos have gone back to Italy. As of 2005, they started going back, and they're involved in massive organized crime over in Sicily again. Rena's dead. They got nothing to fear. Uh, but that's what made Frank Cali so strong, was because of his relationships in Italy powerful frank cali was very very powerful probably legitimately uh the most powerful organized crime boss in america since carlo gambino legitimately legitimately um so anyway as we move on later that year a close ally of stefano bontide and bottolamente uh a close ally of bontide and bottolamente a guy by the name of colodro prosciutto gets murdered in a bar Somebody walked in and shot him in front of like 60 people. They didn't give a fuck. Just blew his head off. Bottolamente was going to be next on the list, but he ends up fleeing Italy. He had, he was, he had been coming back and forth from Brazil, but he kind of caught word that you know his head was going to get taken off, so he got out of town before Rena could ever get to him. Next on Rena's list, or excuse me, next up on Rena's hey, how you doing list was the nephew of Gaetano Bottolamente. Bottolamente's nephew was kidnapped and dismembered and found left in a field in fucking Germany. Granted, Italy and Germany aren't that far apart, but he reached out from Sicily and had somebody's fucking nephew whacked in Germany, dismembered and left in a field. That's some Vlad Tepes shit right there. So, on November 1982, 12, gang, 12 mob guys were killed in Palermo in 12 different places on the same exact day. twelve. So there were 12 murders in Palermo, 12 different guys killed in 12 different places on the same day, all gangsters. And they were all Inzarello people, all Spatola people, all Gambino people. Uh, and Reno was just getting warmed up. Between 1981 and 1983, 400 people were killed in Palermo and across Sicily. There were some 175 cases of missing people and victims, all of which were noted mobsters. Those that were found were all victims of Lupara Bianca. If you don't know what that is, it means the white shotgun. Uh, and by design, it's, it's pretty gruesome. But the body is basically completely destroyed, burned, or buried after being shotgunned and never to be found again. Uh, it's very much what crime families in Italy are using today, still to this day. Uh, the Corleone AC took it to their uh, enemies' asses, and they barely lost anybody. And they won relatively easily through sheer violence and mayhem. Uh, what kept Rena in charge was his isolation, believe it or not. Other mob family bosses were seen, but Rena was relying. Well, Rena had no choice. He had to hide because he was wanted. Uh, but he relied on f hiding in farmhouses, relishing in the mayhem happening before him. Watching a farmer fuck a goat or something. I don't know. <laughs> uh, Rena had established a network of trust with other mob families. And because those still fighting in the trenches didn't know who was on Rena's side and who wasn't, they were terrified. They were afraid to encroach on anybody. That is the power of fear. When you don't know who to trust because you don't know who's secretly aligned with Toto Rena. You don't want to piss that fucking guy off. What a cute name. Toto. You think of fucking the dog from the Wizard of Oz. I love the picture of Toto Arena in court smiling. That smile tells you everything. I'm a murdering motherfucker and I'll kill you and your whole family. Just try me. That's what I'm talking about. When people have that fucking that aura around them. Toto Arena's got that shit. Uh, but because, like I said, people didn't know who to trust. They were afraid to do anything. They didn't want to, like, step on the wrong toes. It was easier to just join Toto Arena than to fight against him. Um, because, you know, because of this, it made killing people fucking incredibly easy. Not long after the war began, six Inzarello and Bontide family members were invited to a meeting with somebody that they actually thought was a friend. This friend actually had already aligned himself with Toto Arena, and they didn't know, but only four of them actually went to this dinner party, and they were never, ever fucking seen again. <laughs> Emmanuel D'Agostino and his son, prior to this, felt something was kind of weird, and what they did, you're going to love this, 
They sought the protection of Bontide's longest ally, a guy by the name of Rosario uh, Riccobono. If, if you want to say it in Italian, it's Riccobono. But uh, they, they went to protection to Rosario. They thought he would protect them. What they didn't know was that Riccobono had already aligned himself with Rena as well. So when they showed, showed up at Riccobono's home, he kills them. He has them strangled. The only one of the six to survive that night was a guy by the name of Salvatore Cantamo, who was actually picked up by police in a strange kind of fucking thing. Uh, and the problem was for the police, the police at the time had no bearing on what the fuck was going on in the streets. And it didn't help that the Corley and AC were putting out false flag and false information everywhere to confuse the cops. This is some shrewd shit. In fact, one of the things that Toto Arena did well, that Corley and AC did incredibly well, was disinformation. And that was the rule of thumb for Toto Arena. The move on Bontide, well, a personal one, it confused the cops because they had suspected that the Inzerillos were behind the murder of Bontide. But then the second that Salvatore Inzarello gets whacked, the cops are stunned. In fact, the Inzarellos were actually wanted for the murder of Giuseppe Di Cristina, even though Rena ordered it done. And he ordered it done to be specifically committed in Inzarello territory because it made Di Cristina look guilty. That's why you didn't do things in people's territory, because in those days, if you whacked a guy in your territory, that was assigned to everybody in the fucking area. You don't fuck around. This is what happened when you fuck around, you find out. That's why you didn't clip somebody in somebody else's turf. You did it on your own. Sort of completely the opposite of the way New York does things. Bonato guys will get Gambino guys. You know how it is. But that's how smart Rena was. Rena says, okay. I'm going to whack Bontide. They're going to blame the Inzarellos. Then I'll whack the fucking Inzarellos. And then I'm going to go and whack Giuseppe Di Cristina, the Di Cristina crime family. I'm going to dump his fucking body in the Inzarello territory to make them look like they did it in retaliation for Salvatore Inzarello getting killed. This guy is a fucking shrewd fuck. And it's smart thinking. It's just smart. Rena was smart enough to realize that those who are friends today become enemies tomorrow. While he used the Grecos to advance his agenda and he used murderers like uh, Filippo Marchese to do his bidding, he also knew that they would become problems. Mm -hmm. Filippo Marchese, who had been a friend and an ally all throughout the war for Toto Rena, killed a ton of people. He had been a real help. But Marina began to worry that he was a threat to the leadership of the commission. So guess what? He's got to go. He was sent a message to meet at a warehouse in uh, a warehouse. Um, and as soon as he walks in, he was strangled by our favorite person, Pino Greco, Giuseppe Gambino, and Salvatore uh, Cacuza. Pino did a lot of work. But he walks in and he's strangled. The body was then dissolved in acid. Rena, knowing that he needed to confuse people, told his friends and his family that he accidentally shot himself and that they had to bury him quick because of his notoriety. They didn't want the cops investigating. And people bought that shit. And even if they didn't, what the fuck were they going to say? No, Toto, you killed him. Uh, it wouldn't have been a smart move. So we're going to end right here for today. And I didn't mean to rush through it. I'm sorry if you guys felt like I rushed through it. it, was, it was, that wasn't sort of my intention. But there's some big shit that's coming down the pike and next next week which will be saturday we're going to come back with the final part three of toto arena and if you thought that toto arena was was done getting rid of people <laughs> i got news for you he wasn't <laughs> there's a lot of people that toto arena wants to rid himself of and he begins to check off his little christmas list of names and as he does he garners the attention of the police the military and politicians, judges, and lawyers who are hell bent on getting rid of Tono, Toto Rina. And the problem that they make is underestimating his true power. And they are about to find out the hard way that Toto Rina's grin only means one thing. 
that you're going to watch your own blood fly out of your own forehead. That's the reality of who Totorina is. And I think at one point, and I can say this now, even though we haven't gotten to part three, I think that Totorina, at the time of his height, was the most dangerous and most powerful mafia boss ever to have lived. Ever to have lived. Because this guy not only didn't fear anybody, but he would do some terrorist type of shit. He would bomb a train, which we'll talk about. He would kill a judge. He would attempt to kill Mario Cuomo. He had even talked about killing Rudy Giuliani. And if there's anybody that could have gotten it done, guess who it was? Toto Arena. All right, so we will see everybody here next week for part three of Toto Arena. Have a great weekend. Uh, for all you fathers, happy Father's Day. Uh, to my friends in South Philadelphia, specifically uh, SNS, happy Father's Day. And I hope it's a great day for you guys. Uh, and uh, know my thoughts are of you guys and your families. Uh, and I wish you both nothing but the best. We'll see each other very soon. And anything you guys need, you know you got. So uh, let's see. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, to my buddy Rob, uh, thank you for the kind words tonight. And well, it was actually yesterday. Uh, but you're a great guy. You're a stand-up guy, a good friend of mine. You give me lots of good advice. Couldn't ask for a better friend. Uh, to my friend Rima, or well, I'll just call you Chardonnay. I, I got a bunch of different names. I hope your weekend is nice as well. And soon we'll meet up and, uh, you know, we'll meet up at the spot to drink a beer or something. I don't fucking know. And hang out. And to anybody else I know in South Philly, there's a lot of you. Uh, I wish you guys a great weekend. And I'll see all of you soon. See all of you soon. And in the meantime, if you guys need anything, you got my number. If you don't have my number, then you're shit out of luck. Because uh, you'll have to know somebody who knows me to get it. So, anyway, have a great week, everybody. I hope you are enjoying this Total Arena series. Do me a favor. Uh, if you can, just let people know about the podcast. That's all you could do for me. That's the greatest fucking thing you could do for me. And also, if you're enjoying the Toto Arena series, do me a favor. Reach out to me at mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com and just let me know. Just let me know if you like it. I am enjoying it. I'm fascinated by this creep show shit. So unfortunately, unfortunately, I didn't, uh, I didn't queue up an, another song. So we're going to have to go out to the P-Funk again, but eh, nothing wrong with that. Um, in the meantime, now uh so anyway so last week we left off with rena establishing a network of trust between himself and other powerful sicilian mafia families one of rena's ploys uh was to instill fear into everybody therefore nobody really knew you know who secretly was on his side uh and and who wasn't so it sort of forced people to, to tread very carefully uh the reality was it was easier to join toto rena than fight against him uh, because of this, it, it made killing a very simple task for him. Not long after the war began, six, Inzer six Inzerillos and Stefano Bontide family members were invited to a meeting with someone they thought was a friend. Now, I know this is regurgitated, but I'm just updating you. The friend actually had aligned himself with Totorina. Four members went, and they were never seen again. The other two that didn't go, Emmanuel D'Agostino and his son, felt something was off and sought the protection of Bontide's longest ally, Rosor excuse me, Rosario uh Riccobono. What they didn't know is that Riccobono had aligned himself with Rena. When they showed up to Riccobono's home, uh, he had them killed. One of this, the the one of the six to survive uh, was Salvatore Contamo, who actually was picked up by the police. The police at the time had no bearing on what was going on in the streets. It also didn't help that the Corley and Hacy were putting out false flags and information everywhere to confuse the cops. In fact, disinformation was the rule of thumb for Toto Rena. The move on Bontide, while a personal one, 
uh, confused the cops as they suspected that the Inzarellas were behind it. Once Salvatore Inzarello got clipped, the cops were stunned. In fact, Inzarello was wanted for the murder of Giuseppe Di Cristina, even though uh, Toto Rina ordered it done in Inzarello territory. And by doing that, it was meant to frame him. And it's smart thinking. Uh, Rina was smart enough to realize that those who are friends today become enemies tomorrow. While he used the Grecos to advance his agenda, he would also use murderers like Filippo Marchese to do his bidding. And he also knew that they could ver- invariably become problems down the line. Filippo Marchese had been a friend and an ally to Toto Rina. He had been real help during the early days of the war. And Rina began to worry that he was going to be a threat to the leadership of the commission. So he had to go. Uh, he was sent a message to meet at a warehouse in uh, Montalto, and as soon as he arrived, he was strangled to death by our favorite guy, Pino Greco, uh, Giuseppe Gambino, and Salvatore Cacuza. Uh, his body was then dissolved in acid. Rena, knowing he needed to confuse people, told his friends and his family that he accidentally shot himself and that they had to bury him quick because of his notoriety in, in the mafia world. One of the other shrewd moves that Rena made early on, much before he became a powerhouse on the island, was he was able to control votes. Specifically in Sicily, the mafia controlled a lot of the voting districts, and for Rena, this was no different. Controlling the votes meant controlling politicians who got elected. It allowed him to forge alliances and friendships with politicians. It brought him the blinding friendship of the mayors of, of Palermo, uh, A guy by the name of Vito uh, Ciancimino and Salvatore Lima. Uh, Ciancimino was hugely corrupt and allowed unmatched property development, which made him beyond wealthy. Lima would grant a valuable monopoly concession on tax collection to mob businessman Ignazio Salvo uh, and was instrumental in Rome-based Giulio uh, Andriotti, who was backed by the right people and got into politics. Uh, in return, Salvo acted as the financier to Andriotti. So as you see, every facet was controlled. Uh, and this was even before Totorina became the big powerhouse in Sicily. So there was pre-planning involved. And we talk all the time about politics and politicking. And not only was Rena, you know, making behind the door deals with families and stacking his side of the fence, but he was also helping politicians who in turn made him wealthy and forced those corruptible to protect and insulate him so you know it's been alleged over the years that rena had a similar arrangement with andriotti uh even if the courts brought charges uh they would find that andriotti excuse me andriotti was innocent of all allegations of mob associations which in italy was illegal now keep in mind andriotti would become the 41st prime minister of italy in seven different governments from 72 to 73 76 to 79 89 to 1992 he was the sixth longest serving prime minister since the italian unification and the second longest serving post-war prime minister Uh, An informant had told Italian authorities that he was in a meeting where Toto Rina showed up and met with Andriotti and kissed him on both cheeks, which he said was a huge sign of respect, and that the two seemed to know each other quite well. Andriotti would say that they were lies made up by Baldessari DiMaggio, and it was DiMaggio who would testify at the trial of Andriotti, but the jury didn't believe him, and it was only amplified because was Baldessari DiMaggio under cross examination excuse me, under cross examination admitted to killing somebody under uh to murdering somebody while he was protected by the Italian government. So Pio Latori. Uh, Pio was a leader in the Communist Party in Italy. Latori was born in Palermo in 1927 and was the son of poor peasants. As a teenager, he was active in politics and mainly worked construction. Eventually the money he made from construction allowed him to enter college where his political ambitions began to rise. He would eventually lead the peasants' movement in Sicily, first in the uh, Confederatera, uh, then later on as the secretary of the Italian General Confederation of Labor, which led, then led him to the Italian Communist Party. In 1948, he would replace the peasant leader Placido Rosato and Corleone, who got whacked by the mafia on orders of Luciano Legio. So Latore hated organized crime. He hated what they stood for. His long-term ideals fell in line with Benito Mussolini, and he wanted to remove all organized crime in Italy. He had known how corrupt Italy was and could be under mafia control. So Latore would be elected to the Italian Chamber of Deputies for the District of Palermo in May of 1972, he would be re-elected twice and would remain deputy up until his death. 
Latore would become a member of the Anti-Mafia Commission, which was formed in 1962 during the First Mafia War, which published its final report in 1976. Latore met with Judge Caesar Terranova, no relation to those Terranovas, uh, and together they wrote what was, what was effectively a minority report which drew the lines between the mafia and the pro- and prominent politicians, in particular the Christian Democrat Party, which Andriotti was a member of. Uh, March 31st of 1980, Latori initiates a draft meant to be made into a law that introduced a new crime in the Italian legal system, mafia conspiracy, and the possibility for the courts to seize and confiscate goods and belonging to those involved in that conspiracy. It basically meant that they could now charge anybody suspected being in the mafia with a crime and they could basically take everything they owned. Okay. So it's sort of a, a very early form of Rico. Well, not an early form of Rico because Rico was already there, but it was like their small version of Rico prior to that. Uh, the mafia being in the mafia was not considered a crime. So Latori and there really wasn't penalties for it. So Latori is trying to push this legal ease to make it a crime. So he begins to make waves for his approach towards the mafia and his demeanor as far as penalizing them uh, as much as he could. That's what he wanted to do. And and that was enough to do a few things. Number one, it meant that anybody accused of association could be charged, and it meant that anything that they owned could be confiscated as a result. Uh, look at it as Rico Light. Uh, and it was also bad news for all those politicians in Italy who had garnered power through the association of the mafia, and specifically Toto Rina. Rina had seen enough and orders his death. April 20th of 1982, Latore and his driver Rosario De Salvo were shot and killed in a car down the block from the communist headquarters in Palermo. The hit was basic. They were parked on a one-way road. A car pulled in behind them, blocked any chance of hit in reverse, and a car sat in front of them. Our suspects? Take a guess. Our little friend Pino Greco is back at it, ladies and gentlemen. Pino Greco, Giuseppe Lucchese, Nino Madonia, uh, Mario Prestafilippo and Salvatore Cacuza, and those were all of Rena's favorite hitmen. Over the years, they have said that the Sicilian Commission passed the hit, meaning that they greenlit it. The fact is, it was Rena's world, and everyone else was just living in it. A few weeks later, Carlo uh, Chiesa was appointed as the prefect for Palermo, and his job was to stop the Second Mafia War, but he makes a very bad mistake. He tried pushing the new anti-mafia law that Latore had tried to push through. And for that move, Totorino orders his death. May 1st of 1982, uh, Chiesa was appointed the prefect. On September 3rd, or excuse me, May 1st, Chiesa becomes the prefect and he starts trying to push the order. September 3rd of 1982, Chiesa and his wife Emanuela were in their car. Emanuela was driving at the time. A number of government gunmen came riding on motorcycles. They forced the car over, which ended up smashing into a parked car. The men on the motorcycles then opened up with automatic weapons, killing Chiesa and his wife and his escort agent, a guy by the name of Domenico Russo. Anybody want to take a guess on who was the head of that? Ding, ding, ding. Tell them what they won. Pino Greco, Giuseppe Lucchese were only two of the named shooters, but eventually Giuseppe Calo, Bernardo Brusca, Francesco Madonia, uh, Nene Garacci, Francesco Spadaro, Bernardo Provenzano, and Toto Reno would be held complicit for ordering that murder as well. Uh, the reasons for that murder, very simple. Number one, he was pushing that new mafia law. And the mafia didn't want it. Number two, he was pushing for information into the murder of a guy by the name of uh, Mario DiMario, who was a journalist who disappeared for investigating the murder of Enrico Mattei. Uh, Enrico Mattei is who owned ENI, which was a huge oil and gas conglomerate over in Europe. Word is that uh, American organized crime bosses reached out the Sicilian mafia to kill him as a favor because his oil policies were hurting the U.S. interests in the Mideast. You guys want to take a guess on which mob American mob boss ordered that hit? It's going to surprise you. Who do you think did it? You guys are all probably saying, Carlo Gambino, Russell Buffalino, Vito Genovese. No, no, and no. You know who ordered that? Angelo Bruno. That should tell you the power he had. Ten days after the death of Chiesa, an anti- the anti-mafia law was passed in Parliament. Any effort to quell the law was null and void, and it, but it wouldn't stop Totorina from making a point. 
Uh, when everyone fled, when everybody fled Italy because of the war, one of the men who also fled was Tommaso Bluchetta. While he fled to Brazil and left his family behind to, to basically fend for themselves. On September 11th of 1982, Tommaso Buscetta's two sons from his first wife, Benedetto Buscetta and Antonio Buscetta, disappeared. Tommaso Buscetta, you can kind of read about for yourself. I don't want to cover him completely because we would be here for the next six weeks, but we know that Tommaso Buscetta was a mobster, a drug trafficker, who had fled Italy after the First Mafia War and escaped to several countries, including the United States, and then settling in Brazil. A warrant for his arrest for two murders was filed, and he was charged and convicted in absent, absentia. Uh, he would move around to several other countries before getting pinched in New York, specifically in Brooklyn, in August of 1970, but was released in December of 1970. In 1971, Italian authorities announced an Interpol arrest warrant for him. While Buschetta was on the lam, he ended up getting plastic surgery to change his face, and he got vocal cord surgery to make him unidentifiable by his voice or by his looks. He then would go on to establish his own drug trafficking network. Uh, eventually, as he wound his way back to Brazil, he would be arrested by the Brazilian military. He would then be extradited back to Italy, where he began to serve 10 years in prison. In February of 1980, he was granted half freedom and fled back to Brazil, escaping the second mafia war, which we know is being instigated by Toto Rina. Uh, as we said, in September of 1982, his sons disappeared. Those murders sort of changed his perspective on the mafia, and he had decided to cooperate, but it was still biding his time. He wasn't sure he wanted to, but he didn't want to. He was, you know, kind of in the middle. His brother Vincenzo, his son-in-law Giuseppe Genova, and his brother-in-law Pietro, and four of his nephews, Domenico, Benedetto, Orazio, and Antonio D'Amico, were all killed on orders of Toto Rina, who saw Buscetta as an enemy. As long as Buscetta's still active, still selling drugs, uh, we got to kill him. That's just the way Toto Rina saw things. Uh, Buscetta would be arrested again in October of 1983 and then extradited back to Italy again uh, by 1984. At this time, Buscetta had enough. And then he asked specifically to talk to infamous anti-judge Giovanni Falcone. Uh, Giovanni Falcone was born in Palermo, Sicily in 1939. He grew up in a very middle class family in the Via Castro Filippo near the seaport district of La Calza. Uh, excuse me, during World War II, specifically during the Allied invasion of Sicily, the, the area had been practically you know decimated. There wasn't a lot of money. Uh, but growing up, he played soccer and was taught from uh, an early age to stand up for what was right, be patriotic, uh, stand up for himself, and stand up for others. His best friend growing up was a guy by the name of Paolo Borsellino. As Falcone gets older, he grew up in a neighborhood that was in a, sort of a mob enclave. Uh, and, you know, his feelings were that they were like sort of a scourge to the neighborhood. They were brutal. Uh, and he ends up heading to college and he enters law school in Palermo. Borsellino also would attend law school, the same law school in Palermo as Falcone. It's then that Falcone begins to wander from conservative leanings, conservative leanings to leaning completely towards communism. In 1961, he would begin practicing law and would be appointed judge uh, in 1964. So Giovanni Falcone was the first sort of guy to use new investigative techniques, including going after the bank accounts and the money of noted mobsters. Uh, it was sort of truly following the money trail and would, he would investigate bankruptcies and looking deep into money transfers and more. Uh, he was the first guy to really come along and do it, and he was wielding massive intel against the mafia. Falcone was also the first to work with Interpol and the first to work with other law enforcement agencies outside of Palermo and also including other countries. He was able to discern trafficking networks and follow paths and shipping routes and ports. This was not a guy who had a team behind him either. Uh, rather, one or two people who gave him printouts, and he would go from there. He was able to learn that those who were chemists for the French connection had moved their labs from Marseille, France, to Sicily. Near the end of 1980, he took a trip to the United States and began a series of meetings working with the United States Justice Department, uh, in part to learn American styles of investigations and to help assist them with narcotics operations. Falcone would then travel to Turkey, then would follow that up to Switzerland, and there was a reason for both. Uh, the first thing was he wanted to trace the labs in Turkey for where they processed the heroin, 
And then he would move on to Switzerland so he could investigate banks that were hiding big money from narcotics operations. He was able to ascertain that the banks in Switzerland were geared specifically towards allowing money laundering and how laws in Switzerland essentially allowed for that to be the case. Um, he was able to find out that former Naples cigarette smuggling operations had reformed now into heroin trafficking, op- heroin trafficking operations. Uh, basically, it was simply replacing, replacing one operation for another. So in 1981, he finalized all of his investigations and he would file a massive indictment. Those indicted were big names in the mob world and he would attain 74 out of 80 convictions. Uh, that in, it included wiretaps, it, it included seized shipments, it included bank records, travel records, handwriting analysis, and stuff from informants. Uh, and, and you have to understand, Giovanni Falcone was the, the first one in Italy to go to those depths to prosecute the mafia. Nobody before him had ever gone that far, never gone as deep, never looked so far. And he had a ton of money to use in the help of other countries and the meddling of the FBI infuriated mafia people. Uh, before, it was harder to convict, harder to get indictments, but Falcone had his hands deep in the hole and it scared the shit out of the mafia because it seemed like he had free reign to do whatever the fuck he wanted without interference. As a result of his convictions against the mafia, his role became his role essentially becomes bigger. One of the concerns was the infiltration of the justice system. They feared corruption. It's almost like he knew that Totorino, uh, he knew what he would try to do. But what he didn't realize was that, was that Rena had already corrupted everybody, and he didn't realize the true power that Totorina had. Uh, Rena controlled everything from the parliament on down, a way to ensure non-corruption, at least at the judicial level. Uh, Falcone established an anti-mafia pool along with Judge Rocco Cenici. Uh, the group would keep to themselves and they would investigate the mafia using Falcone's techniques. They explored new investigations and were drafting new laws in order to help uh, making the prosecution cases of the mafia much easier. The four panel group were Paolo Borsellino, Giuseppe Dillel, uh, Leonardo uh, Guarnata, and uh, Rocco uh, Tanici, and as well Giovanni Falcone. And one of the th- one of the thing that these men began to assimilate would lead to what we call the Maxi trial. And we'll get to the Maxi trial next week, but not before there would be a huge murder. So you got to understand. So here's where we're at. So you have this guy. It, let's just use Giuliani as a reference point, right? If Giuliano, Giuliani never gets the fucking commission case, he never becomes the psychopath, bloodlust vampire that he is, right? Same sort of instance with Falcone. The mob had never been infiltrated in this way before. They didn't have the techniques available to them. They didn't have the money. They didn't have the surveillance. They basically didn't have anything. And once they make it a law in the country to be even guilty of this, all of a sudden that begins to shake the foundation because mob guys are saying to themselves, who the fuck is this guy? Who the fuck does he think he is? And that's sort of where we're at. Uh and Rena, seeing the efforts that Falcone was attempting, decides he has to send a message. The message was sent in the form of a car bomb. On July 29th of 1983, Judge Rocco Cinici uh, comes out of his apartment with his two bodyguards. His two bodyguards were a guy by the name of Mario Chespasi and Salvatore Bartolotta. Uh, the concierge, Stefano uh, Lusaki, Sachi, excuse me, had just opened the door. A huge explosion rocked the entire block, killing all of them instantly. Turns out a bomb had been placed in a car that was parked just adjacent to the building, and it was detonated by our favorite little friend. Everybody want to take a guess on who that is? Say it all together. Pino Greco, who had detonated the bomb on orders from his uncle Michael Greco on orders from Toto Arena. After the death of Chinichi, Antonio Caponetto would replace uh, Chinichi. Falcone was even more determined to get the mafia at this point. The problem was is that Reno wasn't done enforcing his point. Between January 5th of 1984 and December 12th of 1985, Reno would order eight murders. And we're not just talking about random fucking people. This was like determination on a whole nother level. And the thing is, it's going to get worse next week. You think eight? Please. It's about to get crazy. On January 5th of 1984, 
just a guy by the name of Giuseppe Fava, who was an investigative journalist and who was the founder of uh, I Siciliani magazine had written an in-depth article about the mafia's tentacles, tentacles within the business world and within politics. And that infuriated them. Secondary to that, he went on national television and accused the mafia of owning the Italian parliament. On the day in question, he had gone to pick up his granddaughter from a local play. He ends up getting kidnapped, strangled, and dismembered. Anybody want to say who did who they think did that? I'll give you three guesses and you'll get it right. April 2nd, 1985. Barbara Asta and her sons, Salvatore and Giuseppe, were killed in a car bomb explosion meant to kill Magistrate Carlo Palermo in an incident called the Piso Lungo Massacre. You can look that up for yourself. July 28th, 1985. Giuseppe Beppe Montana. He was a flying squad officer in Palermo in charge for hunting down mafia fugitives. While walking in his town with his girlfriend in Porticello, he was shot with a 357 and a 38 caliber handgun with expanding bullets. Now, if you guys don't know what expanding bullets do, look it up. It's pretty, pretty gruesome. Uh, Want to take a guess on who did that? August 6th of 1985, Antonio Nini Casara. Casara was the police chief in Palermo. He was directly responsible for what we would call in this country a trio two, which led to the start of the investigation into the Maxi trial. So in other words, this police chief, Antonio Casara, sat down with somebody who gave him information. That information was notarized uh, and put out to Falcone and others so that they could use that to start an investigation. Well, Kassara is blamed for even sitting down with somebody and taking notes. As he exited, this is disturbing, as he exited his house with his bodyguard, a guy by the name of Roberto Antiaca, 15 men opened up firing machine guns, killing him and his bodyguard. Kassara's wife was working in the, in the yard and watched 15 men basically decapitate her husband with machine gun fire. All because he memorialized a 302, which led to the Maxi investigations. December 12th, 1985, Graziella Campagna. She was a 17 year old girl who worked in a laundromat. Somebody comes in, they hand her stuff to be dry cleaned, and naturally, she goes to the pockets, making sure that there's nothing in there that could get destroyed. What she finds in the pocket is a list of fucking names. And rather than putting it aside, rather than throwing it away, rather than just leave it alone, she leaves and goes and tells her brother and hands them the list of names. Her brother is a cop. A few days later, she's walking to work. Somebody pulls over and, you know, hey, I'll give you a ride to the rest of the way of work. She gets into the car like Adriana Laserva in The Sopranos. And he starts heading towards her work, takes a turn, starts going in the opposite direction. She freaks out. He eventually gets to an isolated area. She pops the lock. She jumps out the door. And our favorite person opens up on her five times with a sword off shotgun. Boom, 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 boom. Dead. On the back end of all of this, We have Tommaso Buscetta, who had been sitting down with Giovanni Falcone, giving up information on hundreds, hundreds of people. And I want to stop here. And I'm sorry if I rushed through it, guys. That wasn't my intention. But when we come back next week, part four, I I didn't, what I didn't want to do, obviously we know, maybe some of you don't, Falcone and Borsellino are going to get killed. And, and I would love to tell you that that was like the, that was the beginning of the end in many ways, but that was just sort of the period on the end of a sentence for Toto Arena. We're going to go through a list of how many people were killed. And we've heard different estimations, 300, 500, 600 people were killed by Toto Arena. I think it's more realistically about 300. And Totorina isn't done fucking around. He's going to bomb a train to make another point. He's going to blow up the whole entire fucking freeway to kill Falcone. 
This is a guy who had immense power. Name me any other boss who had the power to do that. And so I'm going to try to make next week the finale. And it's going to be a little extra long because there's a lot I want to cover. But I wanted to stop at a good point because I didn't want to go into. And then I want to leave it right here so that you guys come back. Because you know Falcone's going to get it. Borsellino's going to fucking get it. And there's a lot of other people that are going to fucking get it. And we're going to find out that how the Italian government finds a guy in hiding is because Bernardo Provenzano rats him out. Because he's the only one who knew where Toto Reno was hiding. Reno was moving from farmhouse to farmhouse. But we're going to find out that Bernardo Provenzano gave him up. There's a lot of evidence. Now, when I say, is that factual? I can't hand you a piece of paper and say, here it is. That's him admitting to it. But there are things that I know that I've learned throughout the years is that there was only one person who knew where Toto Reno was hiding, and that was Bernardo Provenzano. Now, is it true that Bernardo Provenzano could have told somebody and they told? Sure. That's not the case. Because there was a memorialized note in Toto Reno's handwriting. How did they get that? Well, it just so happens that that paperwork was left for Bernardo Provenzano in an abandoned farmhouse. And how would they know it was Toto Reno's? He didn't sign his name, love, Toto Reno. How would they know that? It meant that somebody that knew him was going there to pick up a, a message, a peasy, had to have known it was him. And then you have to ask yourself, who benefits from Toto Reno going to prison? There's only one guy that would benefit from that. And who's the one guy that's not involved in all this crazy shit? So like I always like to say on this show, I don't believe in coincidences. So next, next week when we come back, it's going to get more bloody. It's going to get more intense. We're going to talk about the murder contract on Rudy Giuliani that Toto Reno wanted done. We're going to talk about Mario Cuomo, who was almost killed in Italy. Toto Reno wanted him dead. They were going to kill him. They were seconds from killing him. But at the last second, he called it off out of fear that the United States government, if you killed, if you killed Mario Cuomo in Italy, the amount of hell the FBI and the Italian government would unleash would be insane. Didn't stop him from killing Falcone or Borsellino and a fucking freeway explosion. But Rudy, Rudy Giuliani was going to, I think it would have been much easier for Toto Arena to kill Giuliani. And I think the response would have been less than killing Mario Cuomo. It's just my opinion. But Mario Cuomo came within seconds of being murdered. Seconds. And at the last second, they called it off. And all of that was set into play by Totorina. So next week, please come back. And we're going to get to the explosive ending of the beast, Totorina. So all that being said, I hope everybody has a great weekend. I hope the weather is, it's hot as balls here. But I hope everybody gets some rest and is looking forward to coming back next week. In the meantime, any questions about the show, uh, any comments about the show, you can send to mobtalkradioshow at gmail.com and let me know what you think. But a lot of people, you know, don't talk about Toto Arena. They just don't. Not to this, not to this depth. So I hope you enjoyed the show and we will see everybody next week on Mob Talk.